Okay, so if you please stay in the room because we have just uh, a last half an hour session. So um, we will start with this uh, last session. Thank you very much for all our speakers during the day. I think we've had a very interesting uh, seminar. So thank you very much to, to all of you. So for this panel, we have uh, John Frost from the Financial Stability, Stability Board, Mario Marcel, our governor for the Central Bank of Chile, and Eric Parrado, our su banking supervisor. So thank you very much for uh, being here, and uh, we hope to have uh, a good last discussion uh, and uh, conversation about a specific topic that has not been addressed that much during the day, and maybe because as uh, John uh, told us and Daniel told us in the morning, this is not identified as uh, a financial stability risk at the moment, mainly because of the size of fintech, but it could become. And that's what John uh, stressed out during his previous presentation saying, well, this can be a financial stability risk and we should be looking close to it. So touching on that topic, if we can think about well, if this could become a risk, a financial stability risk, what are we thinking of? Why can it become a financial stability risk? How, what are the issues that can be identified as potential uh, financial stability risks? Yeah, thank you very much, Solange. And, and again, very honored to, to speak in this, in this uh, very uh, uh, distinguished panel. So uh, if we look at financial stability risks, I mean, in general, for something to become a systemic risk, for it, for it to affect the financial system a whole, as a whole, it has to have a certain certain size. Um, but what we notice with fintech activities is they can grow very quickly. So there, the, uh, there's one of the academic studies that, that we cite in, in the report of the G20 that talks about the, this uh, development from uh, from you know too too small to care to uh, too big to ignore to too big to fail, and this can happen very very quickly. I think that we already see examples of this, um, uh, perhaps uh, not not in Chile, but uh, but in some of the other markets. Um, you know, there, some of the players have become very quick, very uh, very fast. And I think that with technology, things are much more scalable. Um, there is the potential for uh, for developments to go much more quickly in the past. So this presents some challenges for regulators, particularly if there's a lack of data, if activities can grow very quickly and uh, and you know they're not part of regular reporting requirements, then it can be very difficult to monitor activities. And Solange, you asked, uh, so which, which are the types of risks that we're worried about? Um, we have uh, a framework for thinking about this. And, um, and certainly, let, let me start, start out by saying there are certainly benefits of fintech, and we, we categorize those. We, we try to take a, a balanced approach and emphasize both benefits and risks. But if you think about the risks, um, uh, many of them are, are very similar to things that we know from finance more generally. So among the microfinancial risks, we're thinking about maturity and liquidity mismatch, uh, leverage. So, um, uh, for example, in the case of fintech credit platforms, there are platforms that, uh, that do on-balance sheet lending um, that may offer uh, the ability for investors to buy out early. So this can start to look like the types of uh, regular uh, maturity uh, uh, transformation and, uh, and leverage that, uh, that we see at, uh, at banks. So this can be a risk, and as we know, uh, banks are liable to uh, uh, yeah, are subject to run risks and, uh, and uh, have to have capital requirements and liquidity requirements as a result. So if the same thing would happen at fintech credit platforms, if the business models look similar to that, then they should be regulated the same. If they don't have maturity and liquidity mismatches, as we, as we heard before, um, uh, then of course uh, it's a bit of a different story. Among the macro financial risks, um, there is interconnectedness, uh, there's systemic importance, too big to fail. Um, and there, there are issues of pro-cyclicality in the financial system. So some of these can arise as well. And I think in particular on, on systemic importance, we talk in the, in the paper about third-party providers. Um, so there, there are third-party providers that could become important across the financial system as a whole, that could become important providers to, to a number of institutions. And if something would happen to one of these providers, then, um, then we have a problem. And I think it's important to look at the, the driving forces behind that. If, if there are network effects, if there's a reason that, uh, that everyone would want to go to the same provider, um, then there might be incentives for, uh, for systemic importance in the future. So I think looking at those incentives that can lead to um, systemic effects later on is important. And 
as regulators, as uh, financial stability uh, authorities were, were, were asked to, to try to predict the future, which is necessarily difficult, but I think that thinking early on about um, how things could become systemic in these ways uh, is very important and, and should help for, for better regulation. Thank you. Well, central banks always monitor financial stability is part of our mandate to monitor financial stability. From the central bank's perspective, what are the risks or the potential benefits that we will see for fintech? Thank you. Um, well, I think that uh, first of all, when we discuss uh, fintech and financial stability, we should uh, think of it as a source of uh, threats or as a support to financial stability. I mean, we don't need uh, to look only at one side of, uh, of what uh, fintech uh, can make. Um, then I think that uh, uh, one uh, thing that we really need is a sort of uh, conceptual framework to discuss uh, financial stability, and then uh, to distinguish between different uh, fintech uh, developments. I think that both ad hoc and the broad generalizations here are not very useful. They can be pretty misleading and uh, maybe a, a misrepresentation of, uh, of both the uh, objective of uh, financial stability and of uh, what uh, fintech uh, can do. So where we can look for that uh, um, conceptual framework, well, uh, usual, I mean, the usual definitions of financial stability, there are a few of them around. There is no uh, uh, global consensus on that, but uh, basically, I mean, if we look at, um, for instance, at the ECB, the ECB defines it as uh, the prevention of build uh, of uh, build up of systemic risk, and then systemic risk as uh, the risk that the provision of necessary financial products and services by the financial system will be impaired to a point where economic growth and welfare may be materially affected. Then we have a number of other definitions. There is another one that, uh, from uh, Rosengren of the, of the Federal Reserve uh, that uh, states that uh, financial stability occurs when problems with institutions, markets, payment systems, or the financial system in general significantly impair the supply of credit intermediation services so as to substantially impact the expected path of the real economy. So what we have in these uh, definitions is uh, first uh, a source of instability from the financial sector. I mean, there are a number of things that may happen to financial systems that uh, may come from elsewhere. Uh, so first source, the financial sector. Uh, secondly, a scale. A scale enough to impact the whole economy. So when you have a rather small financial sector or when you're looking at a small market within uh, the broader financial system that may not have that uh, impact on financial stability. And third, uh, there is a very strong focus on credit intermediation as a basic uh, purpose of, uh, of uh, financial systems. So from here, the traditional sources of uh, financial stability, the things that they keep regulate regulators awake at night, are things like uh, wide fluctuations in asset prices uh, away from their fundamentals. Then you have a breakdown of uh, payment systems. Uh, you have a misrepresentation of uh, risk. Um, you may have, you, uh, have a failure of uh, some systemic player. And finally, uh, loss of confidence in the financial system that, and the, the ensuing bank runs or, or whatever. Uh, and usually you may need uh, to combine some of these to really, uh, uh, <coughs> to really generate uh, um, a financial uh, instability at a, at a systemic uh, level. Uh, and uh, if uh, you look at these uh, different sources, uh, they are related to something that uh, uh, John just uh, mentioned, some core features of, uh, of the financial sector, like maturity transformation, leverage, uh, uh, risk allocation, and so on. So when we have this uh, framework, then we can look at the different, uh, at different uh, fintech developments and see where there may be uh, some sources, potential sources of uh, risk or threats to financial stability, or some sources of uh, strengthening of uh, financial stability. So for instance, if we look at, uh, at uh, crowdfunding, or P2P, 
uh, uh, lending, uh, we see there that uh, there is not uh, material transformation in the way that uh, banks do. So actually the risk, uh, the systemic risk from lending services is, is smaller than what you f have from uh, traditional banks. Uh, it is true that you may still have credit risk, but that's not uh, necessarily a, a, a stability issue. Huh? Uh, then if uh, you look at, uh, at uh, uh, information and uh, information uh, services that are related to credit uh, scoring and so on, uh, then you see there perhaps a, a more information on customers, um, more information on different participants in the system that may also perhaps lower uh, systemic uh, risk. Um, payments uh, system, unbundle a little what is usually found uh, with banks. So you have uh, 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 payments and transfers separate from lending. And, uh, and then uh, the main benefits of that have to do with inclusion, have to do with costs. Uh, and the uh, main risks come more from the operational side. Huh? And the same goes for, uh, a, 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 for, <coughs> for gross payments and settlements uh, systems. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, we can go one by one through these uh, different, uh, different uh, uh, fintech uh, uh, developments and identify both things that may contribute to financial stability and things that may pose a threat. It is true that there is an issue of scale. Uh, maybe that uh, uh, in any case that is not important because the scale of that is not uh, too large. And as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the, uh, a crucial issue in the definition of uh, financial stability is actually size, uh, the extent to which it can have any, an effect in the whole economy. But uh, as John just said, I mean, these things evolve uh, pretty fast, and therefore, at least we might, uh, I, we can benefit from developing an approach to these issues that may connect uh, a different, uh, these different uh, developments with uh, sources of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, um, stability uh, risks. Uh, so that would be my uh, way of uh, approaching this. So it's the, the same question for everybody? Okay, do you hear me with this one? Yes? Okay, good. So Eric, um, what do you think from the super, super, uh, banking supervisor perspective? Okay, so re regarding financial stability, there are a couple of institutions that share the same goal, the goal in terms of uh, caring about financial stability. It's not only the central bank, but also the banking supervisor. But then when we have uh, the, the sub-objective, I would say, we're caring about depositors. And uh, I don't want to repeat what John and Mario said, but I think the most important thing here is trust and confidence. So despite the fact that fintech innovation, uh, new, market, new technologies that have an impact on market volatility uh, and increasing vulnerabilities uh, to cyber attacks, increase concentration risk and decrease of some sort of controls, I think it's important to take care in, in the onset of these new technologies. So if we measure in some way the fintech market in Latin America, I would say Chile is the most advanced country uh, in Latin America. Uh, we have a lot of new uh, applications, new fintech companies, but I think we have to take care of those uh, from, from the beginning. That's why we are starting a, a discussion among regulators how to deal with this. This seminar, I think it's an example of that. Uh, because for, for me, at least for the, the banking supervisor, it's not a matter of size, but it's a matter of uh, interconnectedness and the probably impact in trust and confidence. As you know, we have a, an issue with crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending because in Chile it's not allowed by law. But having said that, we still have this type of institutions. And the problem is that uh, if there is some problem in the near future regarding 
peer-to-peer -peer lending or crowdfunding, pro, uh, pro, it's very probably that the bill is going to be paid by many people, but also by a regulator. And we don't want that. And I don't want that. That's why um, I think in some way or another, the governments and regulators have to take in charge that and, and, and be more flexible in terms of uh, legal uh, actions and changes in the law. Uh, we're trying to do so with the prepaid law that we have implemented in, in the recent months, including a law, including a regulation by the central bank and also by the banking supervisor. But we have to, to do a lot of work regarding a fintech law, for example, as in Mexico uh, and other places are doing. So this is the, the take of the banking supervisor, this is the first approach. Thank you. Well, so lots of uh, challenges, and I've, it's, uh, as it's been mentioned, that's not only size, but interconnectedness. But then when should fintech be regulated, and who should be regulated? Is it the banks? Is it the activity of crowdfunding? Um, when, who, what's the type of regulation in order to prevent a financial stability problem in the future? Our audience here, we did the survey, and most of the people around the room thinks that fintech is going to be very important in the next seven years, and it will change the financial system structure in 15 years. So we're seeing something that's coming, but when, who to regulate, and how to regulate, it's a big question. Let me, let me say something on that. Um, I, I wouldn't focus the discussion on non-banking fintech. I would try to focus also on banking fintech in terms of innovation within the banking system. I think it's important to, to do so. And for instance, uh, in that regard, what we have done is to issue a new regulation on cloud computing. So we're trying to learn all new technologies. And if we have uh, the power to change things, we are trying to do so. So for instance, when this uh, uh, starting the discussion regarding new technologies, of course, cloud computing was one of the most important ones in the banking system uh, and in the financial system. And that's why we work uh, uh, in a very specific regulation, which is very innovative internationally, uh, to set the rules regarding how to deal with cloud computing. And I think we have to uh, motivate in some way not, all, not only the non-banking fintech world, but also the, the banking system world. Uh, and we're trying to, to help on that. So uh, I think that when, when looking at when and, and what to, to regulate you, you can, and who, <laughs> there's, there's even another question, which is why. So we talked a bit about the different policy objectives. There's financial stability, there's consumer and investor protection, market integrity, uh, depositor protection. Uh, so I mean, these are these are the, the different public policy goals, and I think promoting innovation and competition is another one on top of that. So I think that often, um, you know, things things like consumer uh, investor protection um, and uh, deposit protection, financial stability, market integrity often go very much together. So I think that uh, these are generally complementary public policy perspectives. Um, but I think that between uh, you know promoting innovation and and uh, and handling risks, there there might be some some trade offs, and certainly you've mentioned. Um, we looked in, in, in the FSP, uh, in the context of the report for the G20, at, at the range of practices among authorities around, around the world. And what we found was that um, most authorities actually are taking some action to respond to, to fintech in, in different ways. But, um, but there, is a, there are some differences. There are some authorities that are trying, above all, to fit activities into existing regulatory frameworks. Sometimes that requires a few minor tweaks, but you know, they're, they're trying to, to put it into something that's already there. Others are creating a new framework. So I think Mexico is, is a very interesting example with the, the bill so that Lorenzo was talking about before. And um, I think uh, the, the Chilean example is also interesting in that light um, of trying to create a framework. And I think that in some cases, there, there are differences for this. So there's the civil law uh, versus common law uh, traditions. And there are other reasons um, for, for why authorities do things differently. But, um, but I think that the idea of, of uh, trying to create a framework that uh, addresses the risks in a similar way, in a proportionate way, uh, makes a lot of sense. And I think that, um, yeah, it can be difficult uh, upfront uh, to know exactly how the market will develop, but I think having the principles there uh, 
having those public policy objectives in mind um, can, can be helpful. Yeah, let me just uh, add a couple of uh, ideas here. Um, first of all, I think that uh, uh, regulating is one thing and uh, uh, understanding market developments is another. So I think that uh, one thing that uh, you need to do pretty early is to understand market developments. That doesn't mean that you are aiming at, uh, at uh, regulation, but actually if you don't understand what's going on, when things uh, evolve over time, maybe yeah, that uh, you will uh, reach uh, uh, the point of uh, neither regulation with the lag. Uh, secondly, I, I think that uh, even though, as, as uh, you just said, there are substantial differences uh, between common law and, and positive law uh, countries, still there are some regulatory choices that are important. Uh, there are countries that have a very detailed uh, uh, regulations written into law and very limited room for interpretation or for adap adaptation, and others that do not. I would say that uh, Chile, in Chile we are more on the, on the second group. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, regulatory frameworks that uh, are subject to, uh, uh, <coughs> to adaptation through uh, uh, by laws that uh, are issued by regulators or by the central bank and so on. A, a good example of that, and I think a good mixture of that, is uh, what happened with uh, uh, the legislation on prepaid cards. Because in that case, uh, there was a, a framework that was provided by law. Then uh, both uh, the central bank and the, and the uh, banking supervisor were entrusted with regulating that. Uh, but then uh, we as a central bank, we took the opportunity to streamline a number of uh, other regulations dealing with uh, retail payment systems. So there we combined something that was uh, prompted by legislation with uh, the exercise of our regulatory authority with the uh, proper consultation mechanisms and so on. And the uh, banking uh, uh, supervisor also did the, uh, their part on, on that. Um, so I think that uh, uh, I, I would say that in terms of uh, timing, um, knowing soon what is uh, going on and understanding market developments on the one hand, and secondly, having a legislation that provides uh, a framework to uh, apply more detailed regulations, those, those uh, two things may be pretty helpful. Uh, to, uh, uh, to be uh, timely and appropriate uh, uh, and risk-based in terms of implementing regulations when, uh, when, times, uh, when time comes. I think to, that uh, really having the legal framework, it's quite important to be able to be timely because if you just have to pass a law in order to react to something, uh, it takes some time. So, and in, indeed, when you think about it, it has been mentioned during the day that we haven't gone through a financial crisis for a number of years now. So, and even in the UK, where you have collected data from a long time ago uh, about fintech, it's just 2011. So, we didn't have passed the test of what's going to happen uh, with fintech growing as such in a context of a financial uh, crisis. And financial literacy, it's important here and it has been also discussed previously uh, because trust, you need to have trust in the system, but if you are not financially literate, how you interpret how things are happening or the contagious, potential contagious effect that things can have in this context. So what are your uh, reactions? How can we prevent a scenario where uh, we, can, we might be uh, needing or how do we prevent uh, or educate more the people? What can we do now? Well, I, I would say that uh, perhaps uh, financial education has uh, to do with, uh, with uh, some of the other concerns, not necessarily so close to financial stability. It is true that uh, a financially educated population and uh, inclusive, uh, an inclusive financial system in, uh, in theory should provide uh, perhaps uh, 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 additional stability to the system. I mean, to the extent that, uh, that liquidity constraints are not uh, that, uh, uh, are, are, are not uh, uh, too binding, that allows uh, markets to adapt uh, better, 
uh, and to absorb uh, shocks. But uh, I think I would say that um, uh, financial education may have uh, more to do with some of these other aims of, uh, of uh, regulation that uh, Lorenza described, financial inclusion, uh, uh, consumer protection, competition. I think that uh, uh, those may have uh, more to do with, uh, with those, uh, 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 with those uh, dimensions of, uh, of uh, regulation and, and uh, concerns. Um, so I would say uh, financial education takes uh, demands a great effort. Uh, in Chile, we have had a, a partnership with a number of institutions led by the superintendency of uh, banks, so I'm sure that uh, Eric will have uh, more to tell about that. Um, but uh, I think that this has uh, more to, to do with these other dimensions of, uh, of uh, or aims of uh, financial regulation. Um, in, in the case of Chile, I think we have made tons of progress regarding financial inclusion. Uh, our data said that almost 100% of the population in Chile over 15 years old have some sort of a financial instrument, a debit card, a credit card, a current account, a savings account, and so on. But the other side of the coin is that financial literacy, we are really poor in terms of the progress. I have said explicitly for the international colleagues that the typical Chilean is a illiterate, a financial illiterate. People don't like that, uh, but I think it's true. And, and this is quite problematic, I would say, with the new technologies, because people don't know how to use the old technologies, and I think it's more difficult to, to use the new ones. And, and let me just give you an example of that. If you ask what's going on regarding bitcoins, Ethereum, and all other type of cryptocurrencies, or crypto commodities, I'm sure that most of the people don't know how they work, first of all, but they don't know how, uh, if there is any regulation or if there is any supervision in that. And of course, one of the main concerns of the banking supervisor is what's going on when the sunny days ends and we're gonna have some rainy days. And we have some counterfactual with the Ponzi schemes uh, in Latin America, Colombia is an example, we also had our experience regarding Ponzi schemes, and at the end of the day, when things are wrong, people complain. So that's why we believe that financial literacy is an important tool, not only to avoid asymmetries between financial institutions and, and consumers and, and depositors, but also to provide some uh, additional tools for people to understand the products, but more importantly, to understand the risk. Thank you, Eric. And talking about risks and potential risks in the future, what should be the priorities for a central bank in fintech, uh, John? We did the survey as well, and most people said, well, crowdfunding should be the first thing to regulate. Well, what do you think? What should be the priorities for a central bank? Digital currency, crowdfunding, what are the main uh, segments of fintech that we should be caring about most? So I think that for, for central banks, um, fintech credits or crowdfunding uh, or crowd lending, peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer lending, this is, this is something that looks quite similar to you know, credit distribution. So I think it, it makes a lot of sense for central banks to look at this, to monitor these markets closely. Central bank digital currencies is a very interesting uh, uh, initiative, and, um, and our, our colleagues at the Committee on uh, Payments and Market Infrastructures have also done um, done some work um, and, and have uh, brought out some things on this. Um, there are certainly a lot of central banks that are experimenting with uh, with central bank digital currencies um, and are thinking about uh, different initiatives for this. Um, I, I think that often these are you know these are, these things are still in the experimentation phase, and there are, there are a lot of issues. Um, with this, I think the, the technological issues are, are being thought about, but then also the kind of the more fundamental issues are, are we thinking of something for retail customers, essentially giving retail clients access to the central bank balance sheet, which you know, could be problematic for a number of reasons. It could facilitate bank runs uh, in times of stress, um, uh, or are we thinking of something that's more for wholesale? So um, 
uh, again, I'd, I'd recommend the, the CPMI piece that came out a few months ago, really, uh, really helpful for characterizing the different, uh, different uh, types out there. They have this flower in the piece that has been cited quite often, a very nice uh, diagram and way of thinking about it. Um, so these are two areas that are very concrete, but I think that there's also another area, which is you know, ca capacity development at the, the central bank or at, uh, at regulators. And this came up a bit. This is also one of the issues um, that we've identified, the regulatory and supervisory issue, is capacity development. We've noticed that um, talent in some of these areas um, is very scarce. So there, there's, a, there's a lack of you know, uh, computer scientists, uh, data scientists, uh, people that understand artificial intelligence or blockchain. Uh, the, the private sector is already in, in cutthroat competition for these people, so then the public sector has to, to somehow uh, keep up. And, um, and there are different ways of, of doing that, of trying to have the capacity to, to, uh, to monitor the market, to, to understand what's going on, to experiment, um, for central banks to experiment themselves with, uh, with technologies. Um, and I think that uh, you know, these include um, having partnerships, having the ability of people to come in for a short period of time uh, to, to work on specific data. I think there are, there are practical issues around this. Of course, central banks don't want to play favorites. They don't want to preference certain firms over others. But I think that having types of cooperation uh, uh, to help central banks uh, do their, their job more effectively um, with, with these new technologies that can be very, uh, very powerful. And I think that's also a way of being able to keep up uh, with monitoring the sector uh, more effectively. I think that the, um, that the um, central banks need to be very pragmatic because uh, we don't have uh, unlimited resources. It's true that uh, we print money, but doesn't, that doesn't mean that it's for our own sake. Uh, so uh, I think that the first uh, thing uh, to look into is uh, uh, related to our responsibility with uh, financial infrastructures. Um, in actually, in the case of the Central Bank of Chile, if you look at the, our our uh, law, uh, the way in which uh, financial stability is articulated into our mandate is uh, in terms of the continuity of the flow of payments. Uh, so uh, actually, it starts very very close to what is uh, what uh, we call financial infrastructures. And there, some of the of the technological developments have a, a lot to do with that, uh, with um, more um, a potential value added for payments and settlement systems that don't operate on real time, that they depend on a number of intermediaries, uh, that goes both for uh, uh, financial infrastructures within the country and the cross border. Uh, and um, actually, the, the, the paper that the IMF uh, prepared a few months ago at the time of the annual meetings uh, identified or singled out across border payments as one of the most uh, promising areas uh, for the use of fintechs. Um, secondly, I think that uh, we need to monitor industry developments, including uh, fintechs. Uh, some uh, regulators may decide to participate in some DLT or CBDC experiments, uh, but uh, there, again, we need, uh, as, uh, as you just mentioned, we need to be aware that uh, our ability to uh, work on that with our own resources and with, uh, with uh, our capabilities is uh, a little limited. So in the case of the Central Bank of Chile, we, uh, this, I, I think it's, this approach is very well reflected in the way we have uh, integrated uh, technology in our strategic uh, plan. That includes basically a cross-cutting approach in the different dimensions of uh, the central bank activity. Uh, secondly, developing a technology observatory just, uh, pre pre precisely to address this uh, need to, uh, to monitor industry developments. And thirdly, uh, this what we have uh, called the FinLab that uh, goes uh, uh, some way into the notion of, uh, of, uh, of a, a sandbox, but uh, given uh, the constraints that uh, uh, our legislation poses uh, to us, it's probably something that is, uh, for the time being, has more to do with uh, testing uh, uh, in an in a, in a artificial environment rather than going to the public, even, even if it's uh, uh, in, a, in a limited uh, environment. So we will be working on these uh, three uh, dimensions, and uh, I think that uh, is a way of integrating better this uh, challenge into our work. 
Well, on that point, I would say a couple of things. First of all, we have to understand, as uh, Mario said, market development, but don't, not only that, we have to learn about new technologies. So since 2014, the, the banking supervisor and myself, we're trying to understand all the new technologies, including, for instance, blockchain. Uh, in 2014, we already knew some uh, uh, details about this, this technology. When nobody cares about that, we talked about Bitcoin, but we didn't talk about the technology behind this, uh, this uh, currency. So it, it's important, first of all, to understand, and that's why we recently signed a partnership with R3, which is a company that develops a blockchain technology to understand first the technology and then secondly to, uh, to learn about international experiences regarding DLT. So we are, we're working on that, uh, on that line. Second, we want to change the, the reputation of regulators that uh, are stifling in some way innovation. Uh, we want to change that. That's why we're trying to close the gap between innovation and regulation through different re uh, regulations that we issue. Uh, I mentioned already the, the cloud computing one, but also we have to balance uh, to foster innovation, but at the same time to be secure in an environment more, more secure, and that's why we already issue also a cyber cybersecurity regulation. Uh, so I, it's important to ba balance both the uh, worlds. In Chile, probably you already discussed uh, the possibility of having a, a sandbox. And I understand that you discussed some the examples of the UK and also the example of, of Singapore, which they have a more flexible legal framework, which uh, we don't have. And that's a, a problem because it's not so easy to implement a sandbox where uh, innovators and regulators can discuss easily the implementation of this uh, new platform. Having said that, and we discussed yesterday in, in the workshop at the Central Bank, is that we try to have some sort of box, but full of rocks. Not with sand, it's full of rocks. They are not so rough, but this means that we invite innovators or innovators call us, and we talk about uh, the, the innovations. But since we don't have the legal framework, we always said, you know what, maybe you can continue working on that, or probably we said, this is illegal. So you, got, you have to stop do, doing this. And, and that, that's a, a problem that we have in our hands. We are in the middle of a, a discussion in Congress regarding uh, a bill to change our banking law, but it has so many things, so we cannot, we couldn't add a FinTech uh, section to, to have some sort of sandbox, but at least we are trying to do the effort, uh, and I think it's important to set some uh, stones regarding a, a future uh, FinTech law to allow this type of discussion between innovators and regulators. Thank you very much, Eric. So, uh, Again, lots of uh, challenges that needed to be uh, addressed. And we are uh, running out of time, but I would want to just give you, if it's possible, one minute uh, to each of you, if you can give us our last message to close the seminar, because the purpose of it was to learn more. And that is something that as first step has been identified as that. And uh, if we can close this seminar with one minute message from each of you. Uh, I go. That I think it would be great. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I think that uh, the the key point that I would make is if you look at um, you know what supports innovation. You know we've heard of the possibility of regulation stifling innovation. I think that something that stifles innovation even more is uh, is things going very wrong. As we know, uh, you know the the crisis, uh, the the last global financial crisis derailed a lot of you know in theory interesting uh, innovation. Securitization may have actually been a very you know promising uh, promising thing, but uh, you know the reputation was severely tarnished by what what went wrong. So this is the negative way of saying it. The more positive way of saying it is that I think that the private and public sector have a joint interest in in a healthy and stable financial system. In the long run, uh, a system where systemic risks are, are addressed 
and are regulated properly uh, can support uh, sustainable growth of, of finance, which is, I think, in, in everyone's interest. Well, I, I would say that uh, we are living uh, in exciting times. Uh, many things are happening around us, and perhaps many of the things that we uh, studied uh, a number of years ago are very different, they look very different uh, today. And uh, uh, I think that uh, one important message uh, from, uh, from this uh, seminar is fintech. Uh, I think that when we use, uh, you know, very all-encompassing uh, terms, we uh, tend to oversimplify uh, things, or we run the other risk of, uh, you know, linking it to a very specific thing, uh, and then forget about all the other dimensions of it. And um, uh, in this, uh, during this uh, uh, seminar, we have uh, discussed a number of different uh, fintech uh, developments. Uh, we have uh, avoided making uh, cryptocurrencies uh, the main focus of this. I'm afraid that perhaps we turned it, it uh, a little into an elephant in the room, but uh, I think it was worth it uh, in order to uh, uh, represent the richness of uh, what is uh, going on uh, today. Um, and uh, I think that the, the challenges that uh, we face it is true, may have uh, to do with risks, may they have to do with a number of things that usually regulators and central banks uh, uh, are uh, concerned with. But at the same time, we have, uh, had, we have had a, a, a flavor of, uh, of the um, energy and the innovation and the innovative spirit that is, uh, that is uh, <laughs> surrounding uh, these uh, developments. And uh, I think that uh, uh, can make us, uh, I think, uh, very optimistic in terms of uh, seeing that uh, some of the developments that we see today, it is true, may change a lot uh, the, way the world of finance. Uh, what in the, our survey was uh, called the end of the financial world as we know it. Uh, but uh, I think that if we are uh, uh, constructive enough and, and if we um, do our job in terms of uh, understanding better the technologies, as uh, uh, Eric just said, and the products that are evolving, I think definitely we, we can do a better job. Uh, so I would like uh, to thank all participants in, in, uh, because, uh, for their contribution to uh, uh, provide a very rich uh, understanding of uh, uh, all uh, these uh, uh, new uh, developments in the financial world. Well, um, one minute. The, the so-called fourth industrial revolution is very alive, and I think technology changes are growing exponentially. So that's why it's important to balance in some way innovation with financial stability, with regulation, and so on. Uh, we're trying to make a commitment within the, the banking supervision agency here in Chile to say, okay, we cannot stop that. And, and that's a, a main point that regulators should take care. We cannot stop uh, innovation and we have to be part of this fourth industrial revolution. Having said that, we have to balance, of course, uh, the pros and the cons of uh, new technologies. And that's why we try to discuss with all a regulator within our country, but also with all regulators in the world, to have a common language uh, and a common definition regarding fintech uh, developments. And very important is that regulation must adapt to be effective. And, and this is uh, this is a, a commitment of the Banking Supervisor in Chile. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, very insightful panel. And if I can ask you for a round of applause for, for the panel. <laughs> and another round of applause, please, for the organizing team, because putting together this seminar is a big effort. Thank you.